This video provides a fairly conceptual introduction to vectors. So there's not going to be a lot of quantitative analysis, but we're going to try to understand what vectors really are in terms of the properties of magnitude, direction, and we're going to look at the definition of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Uh, essentially, a vector is an arrow. And there are two questions you could ask about an arrow that are pretty obvious. How long is the arrow and which way does the arrow point? The answer to the first question is what we call the magnitude or the length of the vector. And the answer to the second question is what we'll call the direction. Measuring the direction isn't quite as obvious as measuring the magnitude or length of the vector. So we'll have more to say about that later. Two terms we'll use throughout these notes, the tail and the tip of the vector. You could also think of these as being the, the alpha point or the beginning point and the omega point or the end point of the vector, but we'll call them tail, the tail and the tip. So here's a vector and here are a few other vectors and the thing we'll notice about these is that they all have the same magnitude but different directions. And here's a case where we're going to get five different vectors that all have the same direction but different magnitudes. And you'll notice that one of the consequences of having the same direction is that they all lie in lines that are parallel to each other. Now, if you have the same direction and the same magnitude as another vector, then we're going to declare that those two vectors are equal. So actually, here are five vectors. They all have the same magnitude, same direction. They're all equal to each other. And this leads to an important point. The, the actual position of a vector in the plane doesn't matter. Two vectors are equal. We call them equal if they have the same magnitude and the same length, and it doesn't matter where you place them. Now this might seem hopelessly ambiguous. Why would you want to call two vectors equal if they lie in different parts of the plane? But it's actually quite flexible and we want that, we want that flexibility for the kinds of problems we use vectors for. So let's just throw in one more concept. Here's, here are two vectors that we would say have the same direction. And here are two vectors which they lie in lines that are parallel to each other, but they don't point in the same direction. In fact, they point in what we would call opposite directions. So being parallel and having the same direction aren't quite the same. They're quite close notions. In fact, what you might think of is direction as a sort of signed parallelism. So when you, to be parallel means you're either in the same direction or opposite directions and there's only two choices and in that sense it's sort of signed. The positive sign so to speak is when you're in the same direction, the negative sign is when you're in opposite directions. So if you were to place a vector so that the tail of the vector lies at the origin, then the tip of the vector would have coordinates. And those coordinates you would obtain by doing this we'll call the components of the vector. So we could collect these components together into some sort of symbol and we'll use a stacked, you know, a, a column with parentheses on the outside and we'll call this the horizontal component and this the vertical component. And so we can express vectors in component notation. So here are some easy examples of vectors using component notation, which you can check for yourself that these make sense. Very similar to just simple Cartesian coordinates. The key is you have to place your vector so that the tails at the origin to be able to read off the components, or you have to take the difference properly if they lie somewhere else. Now there's one vector we haven't mentioned yet, which is quite a critical vector. It's the zero vector. It's the only vector that doesn't get to be an arrow because it has no length. It's Well, it has a length. Its, it's length is zero. So you can't draw a vector. Now it has no direction. 
it is directionless. There's no direction in which it points. So the zero vector has magnitude equal to zero, and it does not have a direction. Um, you'll see vectors written quite a number of ways in different sources. So suppose v looks like this in the normal font of your source then if you encounter a vector that's called v you, you might see any number of things and you just have to be on your toes so what the author needs to do is to indicate it's a vector you're dealing with and there are any number of ways to do this you could you often use an arrow this is handy also when you're at the board and you have no way of really making a fancy font you could use a bold face in a printed source or you could do both if you really want to go over the top you could use the same font as, as the letter. You could use an italic font. You could use some special font that's unique to vectors in your source. So there are all sorts of ways you might encounter vectors written. Now, notation for component form can take different um, sort of forms. There's so-called column form, which we're going to use in these notes. You could also use a column form with square delimiters you could write your vectors in row form. So typically in row form, you separate the components by columns. So angular delimiters are um, quite common. Maybe you might see parentheses. Perhaps much more rare would be square brackets. In physics class, you tend to use yet another style, which for lack of a better term, I will call physics style. And we're not really in a position to talk about these yet, but we'll return to them in a few pages. And finally, there's usually a special notation for the zero vector. So, for example, you might have boldface arrowed zero, which means the vector zero, zero. And you should not confuse the zero vector with the usual number zero. They're different things, different quantities, different, different kinds of quantities altogether. So, we can do a couple things with vectors. We can add them together, but what would that mean? So what we do is we define it to be this gadget on the right. Now, what does this symbol mean? It means that we're defining it to equal. It's not equal just because there was no relationship until we define the relationship. We don't know what it means to add two vectors until we define that, and this is how we're defining it. And you can think about the definition as component-wise addition because you're taking the horizontal components and adding them together, the vertical components and adding them together, and then reassembling a vector out of those results. So that's our definition of vector addition. Whenever you see two vectors added together, that's what we mean. Take the components, add them together individually, and reassemble them into a vector. Now, vector addition satisfies all sorts of nice properties. Let's, let's prove one in particular. This operation is commutative. It doesn't matter whether you take u plus v or v plus u. If you add two vectors, the order doesn't matter. So how could we prove that? First, let's take these vectors and add them together and carefully apply the definition of vector addition. And then what you notice is in each component, you just have the addition of real numbers. And in the set of real numbers, we know that addition of real numbers is commutative. So we'll make the switch there and then recognize our definition of vector addition again to split those apart into the sum of those two vectors. And lo and behold, you conclude that the order of the vectors does not matter when you add them together. And that's exactly what we mean by commutative. Now, it's important to notice that you might have thought this is an obvious property, but it still deserves proof. You need to verify this. It doesn't just happen automatically. It happens in this case because we're exploiting the properties of real number at the level of each component. And so vector addition does, in fact, become commutative. Now, let's get a picture of vector addition. So we will um, suppose that u and v have components as written. And then we know that u plus v must have those components by our definition of vector addition. So let's draw prototypical examples of u and v. And now we're looking for a picture of u plus v. So one way to get a plus x is to take a segment of length x and add it to the segment of length a. And there's our a plus x. We can do the same thing here, adding a segment of length y to a segment of length b. 
And so using, um, there's, there's our picture of u plus v. It's got to have those components, a plus x and b plus y. But what we'll notice is that we could shift v over into this position, and there's a nice picture. And what we gather from this is if you want to add u and v, one way to get a picture of what u plus v equals is to take the tail of v, attach it to the tip of u, and then create a new vector that goes from the tail of u to the tip of v. We might call this the tail to tip addition rule. So it's a very slick way of, of picturing the sum of two vectors. Of course, we could have done this the other way by concentrating on the other segments first, and you would obtain this picture. And that should not be shocking, because if vector addition is commutative, we could have played the same game with v plus u, and we better get the same vector, and we do. Now, you'll notice that the figure we get is a parallelogram, and that leads to an another way to think about this. We sometimes call this the parallelogram rule, that if you want to add u and v, create a parallelogram with u and v spanning adjacent sides, and then u plus v is going to be the diagonal vector. So here's another important operation, scalar multiplication. So how do we take the product of a real number, k in this case, with a vector, given in component form, a, b? Perhaps a more important question is why would you want to do such a thing? Well, we'll see that in a second, why this is a natural operation. But let's just put the definition down. You multiply each component by the same scalar and reassemble into a vector. There's our definition of what we're calling scalar multiplication. So it's a way of taking a real number, multiplying it by a vector, and getting a new vector. Now, scalar multiplication satisfies nice properties, and one of them is it distributes across vector addition. What do we mean by that? So what we're trying to prove is that if you add two vectors and then scale, i.e. the gadget on the left, that should be the same thing as if you scaled each individually and then added them together, which is the gadget on the right. That is the distribution property. You're distributing that scalar multiplication across the vector addition. That's what we're trying to prove. So let's just carefully employ our definitions. The first thing we'll do inside the square brackets is we will add those vectors. We know how to do that. Then we'll use our definition of scalar multiplication and now we've arrived at these components where it's just good old-fashioned real numbers at work. So we can distribute there. And now we carefully unravel this. There's our definition of vector addition. And there's our definition of scalar multiplication. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. And that's our distributive property. Now, I, these, these properties are important to know because they make your calculations so much easier if you understand them. So you should, you should find a source, look up all the different properties they, they, uh, that, that vector addition and scalar multiplication enjoy. You might be able to figure them out yourself, and you should, and you, m more importantly is you should be able to prove them yourself using the definitions and the analogous properties for real numbers. So let's take a look at what scalar multiplication is all about. So this is really a motivating example. Suppose you had a vector with components a and b, so we could have a picture of u here, and then you add u to itself. Now according to vector addition, this should just be the vector a plus a, b plus b, which again, at the level of components, we recognize as 2a and 2b. And now we get the chance to use scalar multiplication. We can pull the 2 out by our definition of scalar multiplication, and just look at the result. This is very natural. What it's saying is that the vector 2u is what you get literally by doubling the vector u in the sense that you're adding it to itself twice. That's exactly what you would hope 2u means, and it does. So scaling is a way of taking vectors and increasing or decreasing the length, possibly even flipping it along the same direction. So let's just take a look at some pictures here. Here's a vector u, and what we will do is look at 3u, that's tripling the vector. We'll move it out of the way, give some space. There's pi u, which is a little bit longer than 3u, pi being about 
Here's two-thirds u. Not surprisingly, that's smaller. We're scaling it by about 0.67. Now, negative u. Technically, that symbol doesn't really make sense unless you interpret it appropriately, and what we mean by that is really we're scaling by negative 1, negative 1 times u. Now, that would negate each component, and so you'd basically get a vector of the same length pointing exactly the opposite direction. So what happens if you multiply by, say, negative root 2? Root 2 being about 1.4 means you'd expect the vector to be about 40% longer, and because we're multiplying by a negative number, you expect the vector also to be flipped. So what can we take away from all of this? When you multiply by a scalar k, if k is positive, then ku will point in the same direction as u. If k is negative, ku will flip and point in the opposite direction. If the absolute value of k is larger than 1, then ku is actually longer than u. And if the absolute value of k is less than 1, then ku is shorter than u. So let's, let's notice some obvious properties. Again, they seem obvious, mostly because the definitions have been created so that they, um, they work out nicely. But you really need to put a little thought into why these things are true. So suppose u is some vector. What is 0 plus u? Well, I bet you have a good idea of what it should be, but it's worth just taking a moment to see that it really works out. 0 plus u, let's substitute in component form. So suppose u has components a and b. The 0 vector has components 0 and 0. Now we'll apply our vector addition, a plus 0 and b plus 0, respectively, give you exactly what you expect because good old 0, the number that we know and love, behaves exactly the way you think for numbers. And lo and behold, you get back what you know, u, so 0 plus u equals u, where 0 is the 0 vector. The moral of this story is the 0 vector is the identity for vector addition. So here's another sort of obvious property that you really should think about why it's actually true. What happens if you add u and negative u? So once again, we'll just write out the calculation and show what's going on. You substitute in your components, interpret negative u properly, that's scaling by negative 1, and now we will apply scalar multiplication to that second vector, and you can fill out the rest of the argument, but what happens here is u plus negative u really does give you the zero vector, and the moral of this story is u and negative u are additive inverses with respect to vector addition. Now, we're not going to be encyclopedic about all the different properties that vector addition satisfies in scalar multiplication, but you should be aware of these properties. You should be familiar with them, be able to use them efficiently for your calculations, and if pressed, you should be able to figure out why they're actually true using the definitions. Don't rely on just, well, it's obvious. If it's really obvious, you should be able to show why it's true. So let's end with a couple of examples. Suppose v and w are vectors pictured as below. Let's sketch the vector v minus w. Now, there are going to be two methods here. Method one, first of all, we should point out that we haven't even defined what v minus w is. We haven't had any kind of definition of vector subtraction. But I bet you can imagine what it really should be in terms of the previous definitions. v minus w is really v plus the additive inverse of w. Now, how can we get a picture of what's going on? There's negative w, and then we could use the parallelogram rule to add v and w, and we would get this nice vector here, which must be v minus w. That's fine, but there's actually another way to do it, which might be a little more to the point. And that is, we're first going to think this equation. w plus v minus w should give you v. Now, why is that true? Well, the w and the minus w should cancel, giving you the zero vector added to v should give you v. So this is pretty much a tautology. Um, and we're looking for this guy. We're looking for a picture of that v minus w vector. So what you should do is think of the tail to tip rule. w, the red vector, plus some green vector that we have to draw yet should give you the blue vector v. But the tail to tip rule says that if you drew a vector from the tip of w to the um, tip of v, then in fact the red plus the green should give you the blue. 
In other words, that green guy is the V minus W we're looking for. And you can see in this picture that, in fact, both of these methods give you the same vector. And finally, let's take a look at physics style notation and why it works. So you make a definition that i hat is the unit vector is the vector one zero and j hat is the vector zero one. And when you take a i hat plus b j hat, what you're really doing, if you substitute in those definitions, you're really taking a times the vector one zero plus b times the vector zero one. And if you apply scalar multiplication and vector addition, you simply get the vector a b. So a i hat plus b j hat really is just code for the column vector a b and that's really the key to go back and forth between these two very different styles that are both used quite often